Hello, my beautiful friends. Welcome to True Crime and Wine. If you are new here, hi, hello, welcome. I am Sherilyn and I am so glad you found me. If you're not new here, welcome back. Thank you for joining me every single upload. You know I love and I appreciate you so much. We have a lot to cover today, so I'm gonna get right into it. But before I do, um, and before we get into thanking our sponsor, I wanna say happy Valentine's Day. I am filming on Valentine's Day, so I've dressed up cute for you. I hope you love it. Um, but you'll see this tomorrow, the day after Valentine's Day for our Wine Wednesday together. But I still felt like, you know, even if it's a day late when you get this, I still wanted to show you how much I love you and appreciate you. And if you didn't have a Valentine this year, you, you do now. I am your Valentine, okay? We are each other's Valentine. All right, Valentine, let's get cracking. Before we get into it, I have a quick message for you. Before we get started, I want to give a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Dipsy. One thing I really love about Dipsy, I'm going to get a little bit behind the scenes for you. When, when you do a campaign with a company, there's always like a suggestion of things to articulate to the audience. Obviously, you choose the ones that resonate with you the most and that are factual, you know, like actually how you feel. And what I love about Dipsy is some of their ideas to make you think about the emotion that you get from the brand and the product, it's always so insightful and makes me check in with myself every time. They ask you things like, what is your love language? And it makes me stop and think like, okay, what is my lo love language? And I feel like sometimes my love language changes. This month they asked to check in with myself, make sure I'm being helped before being able to offer help to others. Listen to my body and rest when I need rest. Don't be afraid to ask for help or things that I need. And say yes to more things that make me feel good. With Dipsy, they can also help with that by just transporting you into a world where you can relax, treat yourself, maybe to your deepest desires, and feel good about yourself and confident and sexy. If you don't know what Dipsy is, it is a app full of hundreds of sexy stories. They also have soothing sleep stories and wellness sessions. They bring scenarios to real life with immersive soundscapes and realistic characters. There's a wide range of stories to discover, whether it's hot and heavy hookups, adventurous vacation flings, or maybe a second chance at romance. Whatever it is, let Dipsy be your place to spice up your me time, explore your fantasies, relax and unwind. Or maybe you wanna heat things up with your partner and that's okay too. For viewers of my channel, Dipsy is offering an extended 30 day free trial when you head on over to dipsystories.com slash Sherilyn. That's 30 days full access for free when you go to dipseastories.com slash Sherilyn. Once again, that is dipseastories.com slash Sherilyn. Thank you again so much, Dipsy, for sponsoring today's video. Today's case has been one that's actually been quite requested. And it's also been one that I have kind of taken on as something very near and dear to my heart that I've been wanting to talk about for a long time because it's a very important case to my Murder Between Friends co-host, my friend Gavin Fish. Gavin has worked tirelessly with the family of the victim that we are going to be talking about today and whenever you do that, I've explained it before, there's just this automatic connection and you, you definitely take the family as your own. So I wanna thank Gavin. I wanna thank the Greenbergs so much for their help. If it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be able to put this video together like I really wanted for you guys. I am also strongly, strongly encouraging you to stay until the end of the video and hear a little bit about something that I've been working on that I am so proud of and something that is in honor of my amazing, amazing supporters, you guys, and how we are, I just feel going to change so many lives. So this is going to be the first case that we get to do that with. And um, I can't wait to see what happens. So stay tuned uh, till the end of the video for that. And without further ado, let's get into today's case. Today we are talking about Ellen Greenberg. Ellen was a 27-year-old first grade teacher at Juniata Park Academy in Philadelphia. 
And 12 years ago, on January 26, 2011, Ellen was pronounced dead as a result of 20 stab wounds, half of which were to the back of her head and neck. I'm sure if you're hearing this for the first time, you're reacting like I did when I first heard that, and it was, who did this to her? Brace yourself because you're now going to be as shocked and outraged as I was when I found out that the police and medical examiner's office changed her manner of death from homicide to suicide. And since then, they have dug their heels in and fought the Greenbergs for 12 years to keep that ruling and to not even have it changed to undetermined. This case right here is a clear example of what so many families that I've spoken to are going through. They're being re-victimized. They're not even able to properly mourn just so that they can get honorable justice for their loved ones. Spicy Sherilyn is gonna be out in full force today, just letting you know, because what is happening in our faces and to the Greenbergs is deplorable. Before we get into all of that though, I do wanna just, I wanna talk about Ellen. I feel like she's one of those women who when you just look at her incredible smile, you see how bright and lovable she was. Ellen was born on June 23rd, 1983 to her parents, Josh and Sandy Greenberg in New York City. I read a really cute story about the Greenbergs. They actually met on a blind date in New York City in 1978. And just to realize that after all of these years, they're still going strong after that blind date, I think is so beautiful and inspirational. And the two of them had only one child, Ellen. Ellen's described as really fun, very loving. She had this bubbly personality and very adorable. Up until middle school, the family was living in Northern New Jersey, but in 1994, they moved to the Harrisburg area where Sandy was from. It was in Harrisburg that Ellen started attending Susquehanna Township School. And Gavin shared a clip of her at Susquehanna on his channel, and it just got me right in the feels just to be able to see her and hear her talk and how eloquent she was even at that age. So I want to share that with you. You've just seen a brief glimpse of the dreams of the Hannah Education Foundation. I'm Ellen Greenberg, a Susquehanna Township student and a board member of the Hannah Education Foundation. How do you build a dream? What foundations do you build it on? In its brief history, the Hannah Education Foundation has inspired many dreams and it hopes to implement many more. The Hannah Foundation began with visionaries, people who could look ahead and imagine the future of our children. Can we make everyone's dreams come true? Of course not. But with the vital commitment of our entire community, we can make the Hannah Education Foundation a positive and potent force, one that equips every student for the challenge of the 21st century. Won't you join our dream? Ellen sounds like she was committed to absolutely everything that she did, and she always gave 110%. She was involved in school sports and academics, loved playing softball and golf. And when she went to Penn State, she worked as a, a guide who would show around football players and their parents who were interested in coming to the campus. I guess she also helped out on the field and it was something she was really proud of. Something about Ellen that I, I saw as a common trait from people who spoke about her that actually knew her was that she had an ability to bring people together. It didn't matter what group you hung out with, what world you came from, whether you were friends with her from high school or camp or college. Ellen was the hub that brought everybody together and they all became friends too. Now, when Ellen graduated from Penn State with a communications major, her intention was initially to become a speech pathologist. She soon realized though it, it wasn't the right fit for her. So she started taking night classes at Temple University so she could earn her teaching credentials and become a teacher. Around this time, she meets a man named Sam Goldberg through a mutual friend. Sounds like Sam comes from a very affluent family and he is also quite accomplished himself. For several years, he worked as a television producer for NBC and then later got a job at golf.com. From what I could find and read about their relationship, it, it seemed like a very standard, you meet, you've got the butterflies, you move in, you're happy, together for a couple years and you get engaged and plan your wedding and everybody is really excited for you. Things were really falling into place for Ellen and she was building a, a strong, solid future for herself. She soon got 
a job teaching at Juniata Park Academy. Her parents and friends said she really loved her job. She was happy and everybody just felt like that atmosphere was exactly where Ellen needed to be. It was a perfect fit for her. I mean, even her students could feel that. They're, they're first graders and they loved her. She was that teacher that all of the kids wanted and when they found out they got her, they were like bragging and super excited about it. I guess to start the day, she would give all of her students hugs and then before they would leave, they would all get a hug. Her teacher's assistant even said that she would notice such a shift in the students on any days that Ellen wasn't at school and they would have a substitute. You know, you, normally kids are a little bit excited to get a break and have somebody new in the classroom, but not her students. It was not a good day when Ellen wasn't there. Since everything from the outside looking in appeared to be perfect and the right fit. You can imagine Ellen's parents, Sandy and Josh's surprise when three years into her career in 2010, Ellen calls them and says she wants to move back home. This seemed to come out of the blue and so they're trying to understand. I mean, Ellen is in the middle of planning this what seems like a fairy tale wedding. Her and Sam were going to be getting married in August of that year. It was going to be at the Hershey Hotel. It sounds like it was like gonna be a stunning venue with a lot of guests. And she seemed to really be thriving in a solid, secure career. So when her parents asked, you know, where's this coming from? What's going on? Maybe we should think about this a little before you just up and come and move back home. They didn't really get a, a clear cut answer from like a, a specific event that happened that made her feel this way. She just expressed that she was feeling very anxious. She was under a lot of stress at school and she was really struggling to try and pull herself out of it. Since her parents knew how hard she had worked for this career and she had this up coming wedding, which can also add stress that you're not even really aware of. Her father suggested that she see a psychiatrist out there and at least give that a go before she completely up and gives up her job and her life that she has built out in Philadelphia. So Ellen took that advice and she did go and see a psychiatrist. She actually went to three appointments. One was on January 12th, one was on the 17th, and one was on the 19th. After her doctor spoke a little bit with Ellen, she decided that she was a candidate for some anti-anxiety medication, which she was prescribed. Now, if you've ever personally been in this situation, you know it can take a couple different doses, different brands to get it right. And it sounds like that's the experience that Ellen had as well. And it was after her last appointment that she text messaged her mom and just said, this new medication is finally working for me. And she just said she was so relieved. I think that helped lift a little bit of worry off of her parents' shoulders as well since this, this whole thing had come out of nowhere and, and did not fit any part of the personality that they knew of Ellen. Like I said, she was so bubbly. So to be in a funk like that, they just didn't even know how to deal with it. Now that she was saying that the medication was working, everybody could breathe a little bit lighter. And she was even getting ready to start tackling wedding planning again, which she had also mentioned was probably accounting for some of that stress and weight on her. Four days prior to her death, Ellen had sent out save the date invitations for her and Sam's wedding. That same weekend though, she had plans to go with a friend to go dress shopping. This friend was also getting married and Ellen was going to be a bridesmaid in her wedding. And her friend said that something was just off with Ellen that weekend. She said Ellen was always somebody that was always put together and just ready to go. But when she went to pick her up, Ellen comes to the car and she described her as almost looking disheveled. She wasn't put together, her hair wasn't done, and it was just not in Ellen's character. She even said that while Ellen was in the fitting room trying her dress on, she started to cry a little bit. And when her friend was like, oh my gosh, what's going on? She said, I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm, I know I'm not looking and, and acting like myself right now. I promise I'm gonna get it together. Her friend said normally she would just be like, no, like what is going on? Talk to me about it. But she got the sense that Ellen wasn't wanting to talk about it at all. And, and specifically because she was there for her friend, for her friend's big event and getting her bridesmaid dress for her friend's wedding and didn't wanna make it about her. She said Ellen just kind of tried to brush it 
off as she was going through a lot, especially at school. She even told her friend that she still wanted to move back home. And like Ellen's parents, her friend also said, you know, just try to hang in there until the end of the year, see if it gets better. And that was kind of where it was left off. But her friend was left very confused and just had this feeling that there was something else besides just school. Her father-in-law actually worked at the same school as Ellen and said, I can't imagine what stress it's causing her, what she's going through, because everybody just loves her. Ellen is always on it. She's always so happy. The kids love her. The staff love her. He couldn't figure out what, what it could be that was really weighing on her. I want to talk about the last day of Ellen's life, January 26, 2011. That morning, Ellen went to work, but there was a really bad blizzard that hit Philadelphia, so Ellen was able to leave work early. It was a, declared a snow day. We know that when she left work, she headed to the gas station and got gas at 1.26 p.m. and then went straight home. That afternoon, Sam also went home early. Sam says it was a rather uneventful afternoon. We know that Ellen had done some work on her computer and she actually had a wedding planning website open. At 4.50 p.m., Sam goes down to the gym that is in the apartment building to go work out. This is captured on the apartment security. About 30 minutes later at 5.30, you see Sam leave the gym. He's caught on surveillance several times, making his way to the elevator and then going up to their apartment on the sixth floor. According to him, he goes up to their apartment, but he can't get in because the swing latch is locked. So the only way to unlock it would have to be from the person inside the apartment. Sam says that when he goes up and realizes this, he was very frustrated. He's calling out to Ellen. He said that he called her. He sent text messages. He's banging on the door, but there's no reply. Neighbors confirmed that they could hear Sam shouting for Ellen through the door, but phone records show that he never placed any calls. And instead he had sent a series of 10 text messages. Apologies, nine messages and an email. So at 5.32, he sends a text saying hello with a bunch of exclamation marks, followed by another that says open the door. He then calls Sandy, Ellen's mom, to say that he can't get in and she said maybe Ellen's in the shower. So at 5.35, he texts Ellen again and says, what are you doing? A minute later, he says, I'm getting pissed. Five minutes later, another hello with a bunch of exclamation marks. 13 minutes after that, at 5.54, he sends, you better have an excuse. Right after that, he sends an email to Ellen and the subject says, open, and the message says, the fucking door, with a bunch of exclamation marks. Seven minutes later, at 5.57, he says, what the fuck, followed by, ah. Uh. He's then seen on surveillance again, exiting the elevator and heading to the lobby. And we know that he went to the security guard who was on shift that evening. He was the only one on shift. And Sam goes up to him and asks if he can let him in the apartment or if he has something that he can like jimmy rig this swing latch with. And he says, no, I, I can't do that. And so Sam walks off. He's seen again getting back on the elevator to go back to their unit. A minute after he's seen getting on the elevator, he sends another text message. It's the last text message he sends to Ellen and it says, you have no idea. Now, this is at 6 11 PM. And I just want to make note that the surveillance camera is four minutes ahead. So whatever you're seeing on those surveillance numbers, the time is four minutes ahead of what it actually was. Three minutes later at 6.14, Sam makes a phone call and he makes a phone call to his cousin, a guy named Kamian Schwartzman. This call lasts from 6.14 to 6.19. And at 6.21, Sam is picked up again, getting off of the elevator at the lobby. At 6.26, Sam gets a phone call from his uncle, Kamian's father, a guy named James Schwartzman. And he's a very important person figure in Philadelphia. He's a judge. He was on the ethics board. And I believe now he is still the president judge of the Pennsylvania Court of Judicial Discipline. This last time that Sam had gone down to the lobby, he spoke again with the same security officer that was on duty that evening. And he asked him to come up and accompany him to break down the door. And this gentleman was like, I absolutely cannot do that. I gotta stay here. And this is really important because according to Sam's statement to police, the security guard was with him when he broke the door down. However, this guard made a sworn 
declaration in 2021 that yes, Sam did come down several times to ask him for help, but he said he absolutely could not and did not leave his post. He said at no time did he ever accompany him up to the apartment, nor did anybody else who worked for that building. He also wanted to make it very clear that the surveillance of the common areas of the apartment also did not show that Sam was accompanied by anybody else. According to Sam's statement, at 6.31, he broke down the door with a guard who apparently was wearing the cloak of invisibility, but he breaks down the door and he walks into the apartment and he discovers Ellen slouched in like a seating position with her feet extended on the floor in the kitchen. She's unresponsive. Sam immediately calls 911. And if this is something that is triggering for you, then maybe you just want to fast forward until the call is done. Oh, I, I, I need, I need a, I'm, 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 I just, I just walked to my apartment. My fiance is on the floor with blood everywhere. What is the address? 4601 Flat Rock Road. Please come help 40 now. 4601 Flat Rock Road. Is it the house or apartment? Oh, oh no. Oh no. It's an apartment. It's an apartment. What apartment number? Please hurry, Where please. She's bleeding from. She, I don't know. I can't tell. She's. No. <laughs> so you have to calm yourself down in order to get you some help. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. She. Okay. I don't know. I, I'm looking at her right now. <laughs> she. I don't. I can't see anything. She didn't. There's nothing broken. She's bleeding. Ellie. You don't know where she's bleeding from, can't you? Ellie, where blood's coming from? It's, I think her head. I think she hit her head, I think. I think but it's, up, it's everywhere. Okay, so it's I everywhere. Think she might have fallen. Do you know yeah. what happened? I, she, she, she may have slipped his blood on the on the table. Her, her face is a little purple. Okay, hold on for rescue for her. Stay on the phone. Department 842, what's the address? No, uh, 4601 Flat Rock Road, please hurry. 4601 Flat Rock? Yes. What's wrong? My, my, I just, my, I went downstairs to go work out. I came back up, the door was latched. My fiance's inside, she wasn't, she wasn't answering, so after about a half hour, I decided to break it down. I see her now just on the floor with blood. She's not, she's not responding. Okay, is she breathing? She, I, <laughs> Look at her chest. I need you to calm down, and I need you to look at her chest. It's really. I don't think she. I really don't think she is. Listen to me. Someone's on the way. Look at her chest. Is she flat on her back? <laughs> She's on her back. So okay, I bring her. Look at her chest and tell me if it's going up and down, up and down. I don't see her moving. Okay. Do you know how to do CPR? I don't. Okay. I can tell you what to do. Okay. Until they get there, I want you to keep her. Oh God. Her Hello. Yeah, hi, okay. Are you willing to do CPR with me over the phone so they can I, I, I have to, right? Okay, so get her flat on her back, bare her chest, okay? You want to rip her shirt off. Okay, you need to kneel down by her side. Oh, my God. Allie, please. Listen, listen, you can't freak out, sir, because you Okay, I'm trying not to. I'm trying not to. Her shirt won't come off. It's a zipper. Rip oh, my off. God, she stabbed herself. Where? She fell in a knife. Oh, no, her knife's sticking out. Oh, uh, what? There's a knife sticking out of her heart. Oh, she stabbed herself? I, can't, I guess so. I don't know where she fell on it. I don't know. Okay, well, don't touch it. Okay, so, so I'm just about to let her down. Here now, I mean, what do I do? No, uh, I mean, you can't. If the knife is in her chest, it's going to be kind of hard for you to do CPR at this time. Oh, no. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Police with shop reader. 277. Is All someone right, coming here? Yes, they are. You said 4601 Flat Rock, right? Yes. Okay, someone's on the way, and the knife is still inside? Which or what? The knife is still inside of her? Yes, I didn't take it out. Was it her chest or what area? It's, it's, it's in her heart. chest. It's it's like, it, looks like it's right. it looks like it's right in her heart. Okay, someone's on the way out there, okay? Just get oh, my God. Oh, my God. Okay. How old is she? She's 27. 27, and there's no sign of life at all? No, 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 please don't be. What? Been turned to her arm and tell me she responds to pain. She's. Ellie! She's not, she's not. Her arm, her hands are still warm. I don't know if that means, but there's blood everywhere. I mean. I know, but you can't, and the knife is still inside of her. How far? Can you see how far it went in? It looks pretty deep. Okay. It looks three and it's a long knife. Don't touch anything. Yeah, don't yeah. touch anything, okay? I'm not touching anything. This is re I can't believe this, though. No, wait, it was just you there with her? We, yeah, we're the only ones here. And she 
ran in the door. You said latched it shut. No, no, I, I, I went downstairs to work out, and I, when I came back up, the door was latched. Oh. Like it was, you know, it wasn't like it was, you know, it was like locked from the inside, and I'm yelling. You know, so I was from well, you know, was yelling your house and into? No, 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 no. So there's no sign of a break in? No, no sign of a break in at all. I mean there will be when you get here because I had to break the latch, but to get in. Okay, forty six zero one flat rock and this is a house, right? It's an apartment. Flat rock apartment. Okay, that helps. Oh my god. Oh my god. All right. Thank okay. you. Mm -hmm. Bye. There's a lot to unpack here. I I'm just gonna start with i know that we all react different to grief and trauma you can never be prepared to walk into something like this i feel like that there's always an argument for oh they sounded too calm they sounded too upset and staged so this isn't necessarily that this was one of the more calmer 911 calls that i've heard for sure but it was the things that were being said i mean the lining up of an alibi when he's just simply asked what's going on and he's like my 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 like he can't even say my fiance he's like my 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 and then he starts in with i was at the gym i couldn't get in i had to break down the door i always find that very telling when somebody can't even explain the situation at hand they're already starting to cover their tracks, I guess. And one of the main parts that stood out was how reluctant he was to perform CPR. I mean, for him to say like, oh, I, I guess I, I have to. When I first heard that, like I ought to audibly made a noise. I was like, what? And then for it to take like over three minutes to see and disclose that there is a knife in Ellen's chest was so odd to me, especially because prior to that, he was being repeatedly asked, like, look at her chest, look at her chest. Is her chest moving? Is she breathing? You can find out if she's breathing by just simply looking at her chest. Like he's being directed to look at the chest and he is not wanting to look at it. He's wanting to look away. He's not wanting to acknowledge what is going on with her chest. And I have not seen any of the, the photos from the crime scene, but from my understanding, it was very obvious that there was a knife still in her chest. At first glance, when you looked at her, it should not have taken three minutes on the 911 call, especially after you're being instructed to look right there to disclose that it's there. And the realization was just like, that seemed very obvious that it was disingenuous to me. It was bad acting. So the call goes into 911 at 631. By 633, first responders were dispatched to the scene. Now, something that has been questioned, alleged, is that at 634, so only just a minute after first responders were dispatched, so they hadn't even arrived yet, but at 634, an individual who resembled Sam's cousin, who he placed a phone call to, is picked up on surveillance in that lobby, getting on the elevator. If this person is related to Sam, it's concerning because first responders didn't arrive until two minutes later at 636, and how would he have known that there was something very serious going on that he needed to be at the department for if he hadn't spoken to him after the 911 call. I do want to make it clear that the family has denied that this individual in the lobby is related to Sam, and I am not stating it as fact that that that, that is his cousin. I, I mean, I know that there are some like dead ringer doppelgangers out there, so. EMS and fire were the first responders to arrive on scene prior to police. That gen generally is the way that it goes and when they arrive i guess sam was in the hallway and they walk into the kitchen and see ellen on the kitchen floor and they also see that the knife block was tipped over and it almost looked like she was in the middle of cutting fruit there's what looks like an orange cut in half on the counter as well as this bowl of blueberries in this like cute little strainer. Like I said, she was sitting sl slouched almost to the side and on the ground beside her are a pair of glasses and in her left hand is this crisp, clean, unsoiled white hand towel, which was alarming because Ellen was found with multiple stab wounds, 20 stab wounds. They were to the back of her head. There was a huge laceration to the top of her head, her neck and her chest, her upper stomach, and then a knife 
still in her heart. These are the observations by first responders and the fire lieutenant. And when the police arrive on scene, the guard who was at his post in the lobby distinctly recalls hearing the lieutenant giving a quick brief to the officer arriving at the scene saying, you've got a murder upstairs. He's also telling his guys who are clearing the way and allowing the police to go up, hey, you're probably gonna wanna head to the station because the detectives are gonna want reports for their investigation. They were never interviewed. Now it's also alleged that Sam's uncle James arrived on scene, requested to go upstairs, but was told it wasn't necessary and that Sam didn't require counsel at that time. According to witnesses and statements, Sam was led out of the apartment building in handcuffs, but there is no report of what was done at that point, what was said, allegedly legal representation met at the station. We don't know what was discussed and he was released. The next day, Sam's uncle James calls the building manager of the apartment and requests to come and be let into Sam and Ellen's apartment and says that he needs to get a suit for Sam for Ellen's funeral. I'm gonna give it to this girl. I mean, it's clear she's watched some Dateline because prior to saying yes, yeah, she's like, I'm gonna cover my butt here and says she's gotta make a call to the police station. So she calls the police and says, and she's told, yeah, the, the scene is clear, he can go. And she's just kind of surprised like, oh, oh okay, well, I mean, it's, it's a crime, like it looks like a crime scene in there. What what are we supposed to do? And they're like, oh yeah, you can, you can call crime scene cleanup and here's some numbers and you're good to go, just deal with it. So she calls James and says, all right, I guess you're, you're good. You're good to go. You can come on down. But before he gets there, she again wants to just make sure everybody's butt that works there or is associated with the apartment building is covered. And she takes video of the scene before it's cleaned up and before he gets there. And good thing she did because it was then discovered that when James arrived, he did get a suit for Sam, but he also took the two, sorry, three laptops that were there. Ellen had a personal laptop and a work laptop and Sam had a laptop and those were removed as well as Ellen's cell phone. Fair, I guess, if the scene had been cleared, but there was a huge issue because there had never been a search warrant issued on the scene. Nothing was ever removed. There was no investigation. But then all of a sudden the following day on the 28th, they order a search warrant. After James has been in there, after crime scene has come, crime scene cleanup has come to clean up, after the manager has walked through there and taken video, and it wasn't until the day after that that the laptops and the phone were retrieved back from James. Here's where the, the case goes further into the fiery pits of hell. I literally say that because it's how I feel, just like the heat em emitting off of my body feels like I'm, I'm down there right now. So following the autopsy done by Dr. Osborne, with the Philadelphia Medical Examiner's Office, he initially ruled Ellen's death a homicide. Pretty understandable considering the injuries to Ellen. On top of that, there were also 11 bruises that were on Ellen's body and they are noted that they're in various stages of resolution, meaning some of them were fresh, some of them were possibly days, weeks, and even months old. These bruises were located in several areas on Ellen's body, they are on her right arm, her abdomen, her back, and on her legs. Now the comparison given by an independent examiner was that the bruises appeared comparable to somebody who was in contact sports. That intense, okay? Ellen wasn't in contact sports. All of these findings line up with the original ruling cause of death on this autopsy, which is homicide. But the next day, the Philadelphia Police Department backtrack and issue a statement that says the death of Ellen Greenberg has not been ruled a homicide. Homicide investigators are considering the manner of death as just suspicious at this time. Fast forward about three weeks, Dr. Osborne changes his findings on February 18th, 2011, to suicide. In recent years, Dr. Osborne has been questioned about why that decision was made and he has admitted that he did change his findings after having a meeting with members of the district attorney's office, members of the police department, and his boss, the 
chief medical examiner. He said the information that changed his ruling was basically that he now had time to go through her psychiatry records, go through the reports of the crime scene, and then re-reviewed the crime scene photos. I think it's really important uh, just to know that uh, Dr. Osborne was asked under oath if he had ever had a meeting like this before, like that elaborate with all of these officials and asking to have the manner of death changed. And he said, no, never. And I think that this is really important because it does give you an inside look, somebody who is stating this under oath, that this is clear confirmation of how much influence is involved behind the scenes controlling cases like this. I can't even imagine the pressure and the intimidation that would have been in that room. Does it mean I understand or accept the change? Absolutely not. Especially when I know how far the Greenbergs have had to go to have this injustice looked at and made right. If you're a regular here, you know that mental health is something that I talk openly about on the channel. I think it's really important, especially breaking the stigma around it. This narrative that every single person who is on a depression medication or an anxiety medication or who, who sees a counselor or a psychiatrist means that they are suicidal and that their death is just automatically swept under the rug, closed, they did this to themselves, like that needs to stop. Especially when the evidence does not support that. You can't just be like, I'm trying to make my theory fit a square peg in a round hole here. And even though that's not working and it doesn't fit, I'm just gonna be like, oh, you know what? It does, it actually does fit because they took anti-anxiety medication, saw a psychiatrist three times, so it was suicide. Nothing to see here. It fits. In my opinion, there is nothing that supports a suicide here. And one of the early things that the Greenbergs did in this fight to prove that was hire a company that did renderings of her injuries, her autopsy photos, and they made this this like three these a series of 3D photos to show the placement, what the injuries resembled, and where exactly each knife wound was. I think it's really important to see. Um, so you can really get a visual grasp on, on how infuriating this is. Not like you need to, but this just even further solidifies that. The, the renderings, are, they do look quite lifelike, even though they're replications of the injuries. So I just want to put that out there. Could be triggering. You might want to fast forward. So this photo here is where all of her injuries were. This is only one knife, but it shows each place she was stabbed. This next photo is I just want you to see this laceration. And these are injuries to the back of her head, but she's got this huge laceration as well. And we're supposed to just believe that she did this. Now, one of the arguments of why this was suicide is that there were no defensive wounds. And if you look at this laceration, it's pretty clear example, in my opinion, why. It kind of fits the theory that she was probably struck from behind and then incapacitated and it created this massive wound at the top of her head. Now one specific injury, I mean, like we out of the 20, that really sealed the deal that I don't believe that this was a suicide, was the stab wounds that penetrated Ellen's spine and brain. According to Dr. Wayne Ross, the injuries from those stab wounds not only would have caused severe debilitating pain, but also cranial nerve dysfunction. How would she have been able to inflict these injuries behind her head, might I add, and then muster through this nerve dysfunction, this crippling pain, brain injuries, to continue stabbing the front of her body and the final coup de gras, this deep four inch injury to her chest where the knife remained. There was also a neuropathologist that took a look at the case named Dr. Emery, and she agreed based on an independent exam of the reports and photos, there are some wounds that were concerning, specifically a couple that she saw that appeared to have no hemorrhaging, meaning when those were inflicted, there was no pulse to pump out the blood. So she would have had to been dead. I think Dr. Emery's independent exam is really important because in the original medical examiner report, there is an area in there where it's mentioned that a different neuropathologist was contacted to provide insight on the injuries to Ellen's spinal cord. And in the report, it says Dr. Lucy Rourke Adams, who is referred to in the report as Lucy Rourke, says there is no sign 
of spinal nerve damage. But when the Greenbergs started pushing back and wanting to speak with these professionals who are mentioned and, and understand, you know, like what they were seeing that the Greenbergs and everybody who supports them clearly isn't, you know, like how they came to that conclusion, it's discovered that there was never any paper trail for Dr. Rourke Adams, nothing official of that specific independent report being conducted, nothing. She was even reached out to to see what she had on her end. And she said she had no recollection of ever looking into Ellen's case. She didn't have the report that she would have kept for her own personal records, not even an invoice that she would have used to bill for the services. And the more these issues are brought up and clear proof of things that need to be addressed and recognized, just like in David Elmquist's case, there's just never a reasoning. It's like, oh yeah, I don't know. We, we don't have that. We lost it. Oh, she doesn't remember? Oh, well, I don't know why. I don't know why she doesn't remember. But this is a huge issue. This is something that can't just be explained away or just bypassed over and other questions answered. I mean, Dr. Emery's report basically says that that wound would have incapacitated her, which would maybe still fit the argument that she could have done this to herself, except for the fact that the knife was found in her chest. And if she did it, the final injury should have been the one to her spinal cord. And there are big names in the forensic science world that also agree to this. One of those names, if you're familiar, you know, with the true crime world and forensics, forensic pathologist, you would probably recognize Cyril Wecht. He has challenged cases like John F. Kennedy assassination, John JonBenet Ramsey. And after reviewing Ellen's case, he said he wished he had never seen something like this and he doesn't understand how it is being concluded that this is a suicide. Another well-known forensic scientist, uh, Henry Lee, who testified for the defense in the O.J. Simpson trial, also reviewed the case and concluded that the number of wounds, the types of wounds, and the blood pattern were consistent with a homicide scene. Even the former homicide prosecutor with the Philadelphia District Attorney's Office said at the very least, Ellen's cause of death should be undetermined. Four main pieces of evidence made him feel like that. The wound on the top of the head, the fact that she was seated upright, but there was, dry, there was dried blood that had dripped from her nose to the side of her face into her ear, indicating that when that was inflicted, when she was bleeding, she would have been laying down. That's gravity, that's pulling it down. If you're sitting up, that blood is gonna trickle here. It doesn't, it doesn't go up, honey. So she had been moved to the position that she was found in. Can't, can't do that if you're dead. Unless, unless she was working with the same wizard that was providing the cloak of invisibility to the security guard that helped break down the door. I don't know, I don't know how to explain it. He also found though that that claim about the door being broken down by Sam was concerning and also made him feel that the cause of death should at least be undetermined because when you look at the crime scene photos, the latch is still attached to the door and the door frame. Yes, it is pulled up a little bit. The amount that it is pulled out is, is not enough for you to be able to still open up that latch. If you wanna go and check out one of Gavin's videos, he actually tests the theory and <laughs> the amount of experiments he does and his wife Kimberly is just like on board with it. What a good, good woman. Cause he, he tests this theory out and he actually breaks off the frame of his door. He even tried to have the screws look the same and see if he could somehow open it up. You couldn't, you couldn't get in. And the last piece of evidence that also had this former prosecutor questioning everything was the, the various stages of bruises on Ellen's body. I, I wanna go quickly back before we move on, um, just touching on Gavin's theories as well, and I, I do wanna show you not the door frame, but he he had his wife, Kimberly, join him for an episode of doing a reenactment of what Ellen supposedly did to herself. Kimberly just happened to be the exact same height and weight as Ellen. She's also very active in Pilates, and Ellen loved some Pilates. She actually even encouraged her students to do it and, and, and did it with them in class to just get them all nice and zen. So she's literally just like a perfect, model for this. Obviously, before you watch this, this is experimental. This is not professional. They are amateurs, but I thought that they did a really good job um, conveying the message here. My thought when I looked at this is These that it occurred, first, right? I think over here first. 
I think that it went her left to right and around to the front. So we're not going to get this perfectly, but if we take a look at this one, which is L, it is situated kind of between the ears, closer to closer to there, and it's ears. rather up and down. It's like it's about like that. And she is right-handed. Well, oh yeah, she had a towel in her left hand. So, go ahead and grab that. Uh, but it can't be up like that, it has to be like that. Okay. But you're holding the blade, so... It needs to be back. back. Yeah. Okay, and... Uh, and it has to be up that's, here. No, it's, it's upward facing. So, do you, okay, so now you know kind of where it is. <laughs> okay. You think you can stab yourself like that? <laughs> okay, this, can you tell by my, my voice, this is a huge effort. <laughs> that, I mean, you're really, I mean, how much pressure can you put on yourself? From that angle? Yeah. Well, and I... Okay. <laughs> yeah, you can stop. Does it feel... <laughs> Kimberly and I worked out this morning. <laughs> We're a little bit sore. Okay, so that one... That one seems... Okay, now there's one kind of... So it's higher and it's more in the center of the head, so it's like about there. Okay, getting closer will be more doable where put it in the right spot. Yeah. Just so if you were to go from the one before to that one, yeah, I don't see that as working. Okay, so that uh it has to kind of you turn your head a little bit like that. Okay. Okay. Let, uh, let's do the next one. There are two kind of straight in, like at the base uh, here. So like that. I just, if you're going to commit suicide, Seems like an awfully hard way to commit suicide. Okay, I I have very long arms, right? right? I have very long arms, and and I do yoga. I can do a bridge and mermaid, and for anybody who knows, you know that I have the flexibility. That is that is challenging to even get to would, that spot. Would you say? I mean. For forty-six year old woman, you are you are flexible, right? Right. Yes. Okay. For a twenty-seven year old woman, are you still would you consider yourself yes. very flexible? Yes. Right? The yes. average woman would not right. be able to do that. Right. So at the very end here, there's actually a few minutes where Kimberly basically says, uh uh. The remaining injuries make no sense. Like her her arm was aching. I'll have the link to that video in the description if you want to go and watch the rest of it. She also, they try to like recreate the front wounds. I just wanted to show you specifically the back and how challenging that was. I think just having like a visual representation, um, kind of trying to put yourself in the scene at that time just further hammers home the argument that this doesn't add up. Shout out also Gavin and Kimberly. You two did a great, great job. And just a, a total side note, as I was watching that for the first time, I texted Gavin and I was like, your wife is a snack. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, it just, I, seeing that just makes more sense. Like how uncomfortable and straining and awkward that would have been if you're wanting to try to take your life. When people want to try to take, when people attempt suicide or they actually are able to commit suicide, the action is very fast. They're not wanting to, to spend time with this and really drag the process out. It's a quick means to an end. So if you're straining and you're in an awkward position, you're not gonna try to like make that fit. Keep going.
going with it, you know? Even Kimberly mentions in the video, one of the only ways to get to a certain position that would have felt more comfortable would have been to switch hands. But in her left hand, she had this crisp, clean towel. Still, um, you know, with all of this, officials maintain that a comprehensive investigation has found that there, there's no evidence of a homicide. And to this day, the Greenbergs are still fighting to have her manner of death changed. In October 2019, the Greenbergs filed a civil suit against the Philadelphia Medical Examiner's Office and Dr. Marlon Osborne. And this suit seeks to change the manner of death from suicide to what they hope would be homicide, but they've even said, or undetermined. And in this suit, they cite this information that they've come across that Dr. Osborne has declared the manner of death was changed after this meeting with police officials and his superior. Another moment in this case, I mean, there's so, there's so many to, to count, but where I was just gobsmacked was when the medical examiner's office issued a statement that said based on the lack of defense wounds and the door latch, the medical examiner's office should not be subjected to legal pressure to revise their professional and considered determination. Sorry, what? Like he originally was pressured though when he changed his ruling after the meeting with like all the superiors and stuff. I just can't even imagine what it feels like to be in the Greenberg's position. You get this gut-wrenching news that your only child is, is not here anymore. You're told it's murder. And then the next day it's changed to, we're actually looking into it being suspicious. And then a few weeks later it's changed to suicide. And for 12 years and multiple well-renowned experts can't make sense of this conclusion, you have no choice but to fight. We just passed the 12 year anniversary of Ellen's death. You guys, when you just put that number into consideration, it just goes to show you how ass backwards this is. I think it's so important to just remember and know and just really grasp that fighting for justice doesn't just mean talking about it and, and getting a meeting with officials. It costs so much money. This is political, man, and that's disgusting. Families are forced into bankruptcy, physical, mental depletion of their health. And it's like they're, they're treated like villains. Like why is justice hard? Why is the right thing this hard? Like there has to be a change. There has to be like this independent, truly independent, unbiased agency that steps in when something like this is happening. All of these years, all of this proof in my opinion, it's just so wrong. And it should be really, really concerning to everybody because this happens every day. And this can happen to any, any one of us at any time. And that's terrifying to think about. I've thought a lot about Alan and I think one of the things that hits very close to home with me and why I absolutely wanted to talk about this case was it resonated personally with me because it was clear that Ellen was going through some changes in her life. She was experiencing this anxiety, sadness, but most importantly, this desire to come home. And because of the bruises that were on Ellen, it is believed that she was potentially in a domestic violence situation. And when I heard about the door latch, it gave me goosebumps because I've been in a very similar situation. I can't speak for Ellen and, and say 100% she was in a domestic violence situation, but I can speak for myself and say I was. And now I do this often. To this day, I still, I still do this. It's a force of habit where I lock the doors the second that I walk into the house. I mean, just a few weeks ago, this happened. I locked the doors, I fell asleep, and Brent had gone out to pick up the girls. So he arrives and I always sleep with my, my phone. Well, not sleep with, my phone is always on silent. So if you call me, that's, that's useless unless I'm awake. So he's calling, texting, doing nothing, knocking on the door, ringing the doorbell. I slept through it all. I wasn't feeling good, okay? So when I wake up, I see all these calls and texts. And I'm like, oh my God, call him back, realized he's like, Hey babe, you, you, you locked the door, hey? I was like, yeah, yeah, sorry about that. But he he knows me, he, he knows this is something that I do. He had gone over to my parents' house, they lived just down the road, told them, you know, we'll wait for <laughs> Sherilyn to wake up and let us in. And I did, and they came home. When this happened in my previous relationship though, when I opened the door, I was tossed aside and my apartment was ransacked, looking for someone I was cheating with, just based on the text messages and what was said in them, especially 
you have no idea. That's a, automatically where my thoughts went back to. Like I said, I can only speak for myself in this situation, but the argument that, oh, there were never ever any reports that anything thing like that was going on in their home or in their relationship to me means absolute shit. Most often it, it isn't reported. To this day, I still struggle saying out loud that I was in a domestic violence situation. It's been over 10 years. I'm married, I've had two children since that relationship. I just wanna put that out there. I mean, I know those who know me personally know that the, that, that relationship was not my oldest daughter's father. He's wonderful. That is not who I'm referring to. Just Got to put that out there. I don't want any speculation. But yeah, this, this has been this has been 10 years gone. I'm married to somebody who makes me feel so protected. But I know to this day, if I were still to see this individual in public, I would have a physical reaction. And the reason why it might have also not been reported is that Ellen might have not even recognized she was going through something like this. If you've been in this situation, you make excuses. You're also embarrassed. To me, it was just really telling that she made it very clear she, she wanted out, but maybe wasn't mentally or emotionally prepared to put it out there out loud and say why. Again, I'll just make it really clear that this is based off of my own personal experience. We do not have any sort of record of Ellen admitting that this is what she's going through, but just based on statistics, it doesn't mean that it wasn't happening. The fact that the bruises described on her body were compared to those of somebody who played contact sports and that they were in various stages of healing also I think is very strong evidence. Now I know there are so many of you who wanna help out with this case. Your, your help on everything that we do means so much, you guys. Families like the Greenbergs, they need us. The expenses of the resources that have been used to prove their argument of Ellen's death not being a suicide cost more money than I can comprehend. This is so frustrating to say when I say out loud. This is, doesn't even count the legal fees. Being just dragged and, and prolonged in court hoping that this will just go away. No one is prepared for this. So like I said at the beginning of the video, I have some news that I'm so proud of. I know that I have mentioned it a few months back that I was in the process of trying to start a nonprofit organization. And I am so excited to say that it has officially been approved and recognized. Allow me to introduce you to the Sippendale Foundation, named after you guys. And moving forward, this is gonna be where all of our donations go to help families. I really wanted to do this to make sure that huge uh, amounts of money weren't being deducted like they are on other fundraising platforms. Although if you do come across a GoFundMe and you're more co comfortable donating to that, that is absolutely okay. But for, for those families who, who don't have anything like that set up or if you want a place to donate that you know a large percentage won't be taken from that's why I've set this up and I've also set it up where the, the foundation itself has a, a huge goal I've set the goal to a hundred thousand dollars and that's just for the foundation so that we have money when we come across cases who need immediate assistance we have a pool I also want to help families with strategic ways of getting their loved one's story told so digital advertising has has come on my radar and I'm really excited to to use that as another method to get somebody's story out there so for those types of things, that's what the, the foundation and a whole's main goal will be used for. But then for cases like this, that specific victim and family will have their own campaign. So when you go over to my foundation, the website is sippendalefoundation.org or .com, you'll see Ellen's campaign page where you can donate there. And we have a large goal, but I feel like if anybody's gonna do it, it's gonna be the Sippendales and I don't have a $5 minimum so you can donate whatever you would like. I have it set to $20,000. And I mean, there's almost 200 thousand of you subscribed to this channel. Can you imagine what we could do with just one dollar from each of you? I just, I, I can't imagine. I get so excited and so proud because I know if anybody can do it, we can do it. And the green, the Greenbergs, they need us. They've been at this for 12 years. It just breaks my heart. It makes me feel sick and it makes me want to cry. It's just so wrong. They've done everything right. Hired independent experts, had second, third, fourth, fifth opinions done. They, they have a lawyer who's been fighting alongside them and they're just, they're still, still being dragged. So like the, the fight is not over. 
by any means, and, and that sucks to say. So I'd love to be able to bring them some amazing news that we support their fight and alleviate some of the that strain so they can keep going. All right, you guys, that is it for me today. If you haven't already, please don't forget to like and subscribe. It means the world to me. I love and I appreciate you so much. I will see you in the next video. I will miss you terribly until then. Make sure to love each other, love yourself, and I will see you soon. And thank you so much in advance for everybody who is going to go and support the foundation and support the Greenbergs. I can't wait. Love you, bye.